We have an five-year-old, and he's about to have a birthday, which means he's going to be six. Can you guess what I'm getting him for his birthday? But I need to do some work to this thing before I can give it to him. Right now, sitting behind me is a 136cc, 4-horsepower gas engine with a belt-drive CVT and centrifugal clutch. Small engines like this one are noisy, hateful things, so this thing's gotta go. Besides, this engine has some sort of problem with it, and it randomly dies, and I don't feel like working on it. So, I'm going to convert this go-kart to electric. But for funsies, and as an experiment that I've always wanted to do, instead of buying a motor off the shelf, I'm going to see if I can power this go-kart using one of these converted to a motor. This being a used car alternator that I bought from a junkyard for a whopping five dollars. <laughs> And for power, I'm going to try using two of these. Your garden variety, specifically lawn garden variety, 40 volt lithium battery packs from Green Brand. And the reason I want to try using these is because I already have them. So essentially, they're free. And they already have BMS circuitry built in, so I don't have to worry about accidentally over discharging the lithium cells within them. Let's fix it. Ah! <laughs> so, what do you think? Will I be able to make this project work? Or will I just end up with an unfinished project and a very disappointed six year old? I don't know. Let's find out together. Oh, yeah. Now we have just bare chain drive and disc brake. By the way, this thing has one disc brake and it's actually hydraulically actuated. An alternator and a three phase motor slash generator are nearly the same thing, but with a few key differences. Aside from, you know, the name. In both, the stator, the stationary part, consists of, in this simplified example, three pairs of electromagnetic coils. In the actual alternator I'm using, it's 18 pairs, but it works the same way, so it doesn't matter. If we isolate one pair of these coils and one sine wave, you can see as we travel down the sine wave, the electromagnetic field's intensity is varying, and the polarity is flipping back and forth. But this isn't a single-phase setup, it's a three-phase setup. And if we include all the phases with their respective pairs, you can see that as we travel down the three sine waves, it generates a rotating magnetic field. And this works both ways. In a generator, you put a rotational force to spin the rotor into the generator, and that generates three-phase power out of the stator that can then be exported elsewhere, like, I don't know, the entire electric grid. And in a motor, you put three-phase power into the stator, and it spins the rotor. As I mentioned, the stator from my random trash bin find alternator has 18 pairs of coils instead of just three. And as you can see through the aid of this magnetic viewing film, if I supply a small DC current to just one of the phase windings, it's every third stator slot that gets magnetized. And just for fun, I hooked up the stator to my motor controller so you can watch the rotational magnetic field happen in real time with the magnetic viewing film. I think that's pretty cool. In a typical three-phase generator slash motor, the rotor is either made of some sort of conductive material, aluminum, copper, laminated steel, what have you, or it's made of permanent magnets. If the rotor is made of some sort of conductive material, then it's an asynchronous induction motor. And it's called such because the rotating magnetic field generated by the stator passes over the rotor and generates or induces an electric current into the rotor, causing it to be dragged along with that rotating magnetic field. It's called asynchronous because it drags along behind that rotating magnetic field and is therefore out of sync with it. If the rotor is made of permanent magnets, then it's a permanent magnet synchronous motor because the permanent magnets in the rotor follow along exactly with that rotating magnetic field and it's perfectly in sync with it. In an alternator, the rotor is another field winding. It's an electromagnet. And the reason for this is voltage regulation, because an alternator is hooked up to an engine, an engine that varies in speed. If that rotor was a permanent magnet, then the voltage output of the alternator would vary greatly depending on the speed of the engine. But obviously, you don't want that. You want your alternator to put out a constant 13 point whatever volts, no matter what speed the engine is turning at. And the way it achieves this is by having the rotor be energized by the voltage regulation circuitry on board the alternator. So it can vary the amount of current going into the rotor, which varies the magnetic intensity produced by that rotor, depending on the speed that the engine is turning. So for instance, if the engine is spinning at idle, then a fairly high current will be pumped into that rotor, 
creating a fairly high magnetic field intensity. And if the engine is spinning at say 5,000 RPMs, then the current being pumped into the rotor will be much less, producing a much lower magnetic field intensity. Also, the alternator can output a constant 13 point whatever volts, no matter the speed it's turning. This is the rotor for my scrap bin alternator, and power is provided to this field winding in the middle here through these two slip rings with these brushes that ride on them like so. And this is the only wear item in the alternator, and as you can see, my slip rings and brushes are quite worn, but it should work well enough for my purposes anyway. If you're wondering what those claws around the rotor winding are, those are to direct the polarity of the magnetic field produced by the rotor winding. If those claws weren't there, then the magnetic poles would go out of the rotor axially, which wouldn't do any good at all. These wrap it around the rotor so you have north-south, north-south around the rotor so it can actually, you know, work. So all I need to do to convert an alternator into a three-phase motor is remove the diode pack that rectifies the alternating current coming out of the stator into direct current, remove the voltage regulation circuitry that I don't need anymore, solder a couple of wires directly to the brushes so we can power the rotor, essentially turning it into a permanent magnet motor, something like this. And I'm powering my rotor using this small buck converter, which will take the 40 or so volts from the battery and regulate it down to a constant voltage or a constant current. I've got this one regulated down to about 3 amps because, I don't know, I just guessed. And, if it's not already done so, wire the stator terminals into the delta configuration. My stator happened to have its terminals already wired in the delta configuration, so all I had to do was solder on some leads to extend them out a bit. I did take apart an alternator earlier that had six individual wires coming out of the stator, one for each end of each phase winding that I had to manually wire into the delta configuration, but I ended up not using that alternator because I accidentally broke it. Whoops. Now that my alternator has been converted to a motor by virtue of removing things, let's give it a test. And by the way, my speed controller of choice, the thing that produces the three-phase signal to drive the motor, is this no-name 1500 watt jobber I bought off Amazon for like 80 bucks. It came with absolutely no instructions and all the labels are in Chinese. And I've got a throttle to control it all. Now let's plug up the battery and see that it works, because I've been testing this. Ready? I lied! Oh wait, I forgot to connect the power, ba power cable here. Let's fix it. Ah! <laughs> Let's fix that. Okay, it's it's on. Now it works. I found this little piece here to use as my drive sprocket, and as you can see, it's shiny. That's because for some reason it was a little bit too wide and the chain didn't fit on it, so I had to turn it down on the lathe to make it a little bit narrower. And now it works perfectly. And here I thought I bought that mini lathe and it was gonna be completely useless. Well now I've used it once. Now this sprocket is a little bit bigger than the drive sprocket that was on the engine. The one that was on the engine is 10 teeth. This one is 15 teeth, so it will be a little bit higher geared than it was before. Hopefully that won't be an issue. Now I need to figure out a way to adapt this to the alternator. As you can see, I've got the alternator roughly in place of where it's going to go. I might as well go ahead and reuse the old engine mounts that are already there. I've got the alternator sitting on the front bolt for the old front engine mount. I need to machine some spacers to position the alternator on that bolt. And I'm going to make a little bar that sits underneath the alternator and sort of supports it from the bottom using this jacking screw that was the old rear engine mount. Yeah, that's gonna work. 
Now I think it's time to hook up the wiring and the motor control and everything and spin the wheels with the motor and see how well it worked. It's a pretty good first start. I don't really know how it performs until I, you know, sit on it and actually use the motor to power myself forward. But for now I can tell two things are slightly problematic. This wheel is a bit loose, which is no problem. There's just a castle nut holding this on. I can tighten that up a bit. And that brake rotor is more warped than my perception of reality. So I'll probably have to find a replacement for that or take it off. I don't know. I'm able, may be able to run without it. Anyway, on to wiring and permanently mounting some of this stuff. But before I do that, you'll likely want to know about power output of this little alternator turned motor. And frankly, I don't know how much power this little motor is going to turn out. But I can make a guess because this little motor controller that I'm using is rated at 1500 watts, which is the equivalent of just a tick over two horsepower. Now that's input power of the motor controller, not output power of the motor itself, but if we assume a 20% loss, that means that this motor will be putting out 1.6 horsepower. For reference, the big stinky gas engine I took off of here is rated at four horsepower. And I know what you're thinking, that's more. You're going to put a weaker motor on this thing? Well, yes, but I want you to remember a couple of things. One, this is probably going to be putting out way more torque than it is horsepower, because it's a relatively slow motor and it's relatively big. And also, the main driver of this contraption is going to be a six-year-old. So no matter how much power this thing puts out, I'm going to speed limit it anyway. And if he ever outgrows the power that this thing puts out, well, I don't have to upgrade the alternator itself, I can just upgrade the motor controller probably to a 3000 watt speed controller, and that would bring horsepower right up to four, which is the equivalent of the big stinky gas engine that I took off of it. And after a quick lick of paint and a duplication, I've got these two little bars that I can mount to the frame and then mount stuff onto them. By the way, if you want one of these drill powered riveters, I've got a link in the description. To mount these 36 volt batteries onto the go-kart, I would use a 3D printer and print a couple of battery mounts with some leads coming off of them. But I don't have a 3D printer, at least not yet anyway. I've got one coming fairly soon, but until that gets here, I'm gonna use the chargers that came with the battery. I'm just going to solder a couple of leads onto the negative and positive of the battery and have them stick out of the case. The chargers will still work perfectly fine, but now I can directly connect to the batteries using these. And by the way, the reason I'm using two of these batteries in parallel is because of amperage output. One of my patrons told me that one of these Ryobi batteries is only good for a kilowatt of output, and since my motor controller draws 1.5 kilowatts, I figure I better parallel two of them together. This is going to look real stupid, but this is the container I'm going to use to house the DC power supply that's going to power the rotor here. When I get a 3D printer, I'll print an enclosure that's a little more permanent and a little less kitchenware. After some soldering and some assimilating, this is the setup I have right now. I've got my two 40 volt batteries right here wired in parallel to the motor controller. I've got a couple of live wires coming off of the speed controller going into my takeout container full of DC power supply bolognese that's feeding in a constant 12 volts at 5 amps into the rotor to energize that. I've got the three-phase wires from the alternator connected to the three-phase output of the speed controller and I have my throttle temporarily hooked up right here and going up to a switch that was already on the go-kart up at the front I've got the ignition to energize and de-energize this motor controller. Unfortunately, there's a problem. As you can see right now, the go-kart's up on jack stands. If I turn it on and use the throttle, works just fine. But if I take it down off the jack stands, remember to always lift with your back. Now, it doesn't work. It just sort of sits there and twitches. I've been thinking for a little bit on what this problem could be, and frankly, I don't know. But I do have a couple of ideas. An alternator turned motor is a permanent magnet three-phase motor. 
Okay, it actually isn't. There's no permanent magnet in there. It's an electromagnet, but it behaves the same way as a permanent magnet motor. So that's how I'm going to refer to it. And the thing about permanent magnet motors is, in order for them to behave optimally, they need sensors in them so that the motor controller can tell where in its rotation the rotor is in order for it to keep the rotating magnetic field of the stator in sync with the rotor. If we assume this stick with two magnets stuck to it is my stator, and this stick on a bearing with two magnets stuck to it is my rotor, you can see when I spin up the rotating magnetic field of the stator, the rotor stays perfectly in sync. Unless I provide a resistance torque to the rotor, then the rotor falls out of sync with the stator and it just sort of sits there and twitches. My problem could be that because my alternator turn motor is a sensorless motor, the speed controller doesn't have any idea what the rotor is doing, so it's just chucking a three-phase signal at the stator and hoping the rotor stays in sync with that rotating magnetic field. But because of the resistance torque on startup, the rotor immediately falls out of sync with that rotating magnetic field and just sort of sits there and twitches. Maybe. That's just a guess. And by the way, this problem is only on startup. If I give the go-kart a nudge, well then it takes off and has no trouble whatsoever. <laughs> or the problem is something to do with my motor controller that I don't understand. I mean, I bought the thing from China, and it has all Chinese labeling on it, and it came with no instructions whatsoever, so that seems likely. I've read online, and I don't know if this is true, that in the absence of hall sensors, the motor controller will somehow use one of the stator windings to somehow sense the position of the rotor and base its calculations on that. I don't know how that would work, but it does seem to hold some truth to it, because if you remember when I showed you the magnetic viewing film in the stator with no rotor in it, the motor controller just sent a couple of steps and then stopped working. So clearly, despite the absence of any hall sensors whatsoever, that motor controller was able to sense whether or not a rotor was in there. So maybe it has something to do with that. Maybe the resistance torque on startup isn't allowing the rotor to spin up enough for the motor controller to sense its existence or position? I really don't know. Regardless of what's causing my problem, I know what I'm going to do to at least try to fix it. Since all of my issues seem to be based around the fact that my motor is a sensorless motor, I'm going to add sensors to it. What I have here is a bag of hall sensors. By the way, if you don't know what a hall sensor is, it detects a magnetic field. It turns on or off based on the presence of a magnetic field. That's all it does. I'm going to add these to my alternator and turn it into a proper censored permanent magnet motor without the permanent magnet. And hopefully that will fix my issue. I've had to widen some of the stator slots ever so slightly with my carbide angry bit here, but now their hull effect sensors are taped in place temporarily. i to make sure they work before epoxying them in place. One, two, three. They all three still work. And here's the hull effect sensors after I've got them epoxied in place in the stator slots. It's not exceedingly perfect, but as long as they work, don't fall out, and don't protrude into the rotor, it'll be good. Now to test the Hall effect sensors one last time. Let's energize the rotor with this 18 volt battery. And they all still work. Now I wasn't expecting all these LEDs to flash at the same time. I was expecting them to flash in sequence. So either the Hall sensors are in the wrong place or I was expecting the wrong result. I don't know. We'll have to find out. Now the hard part. There are three phase leads and there are three Hall sensor leads. There are 36 possible combinations of these wires. So now I need to try all 36 possible combinations to figure out the two that are correct. And try I did, but none of those 36 wiring combinations worked, or indeed did anything at all. But that's okay, because after a long bout of giving up and a short epiphany, I figured out why. This is the simple equation I used to figure out the hall sensor placement in my stator. And I misinterpreted the one and only variable in this equation, PP. Do try to contain yourselves. I thought this was the number of pole pairs, that's what PP stands for, in the stator. But it's actually the number of pole pairs in the rotor, which in my case is 6. So if we plug 6 into this equation, we get 20. 20 is the number of mechanical degrees of rotation for every 120 degrees of electrical rotation. And since my stator has slots every 10 degrees, that means I need to put a hall sensor every other slot which is a far cry from every 12 slots like I have it now. So I need to reposition two of my hall sensors, reassemble everything, and hopefully, after doing that, it will work. 
This will be the fourth time I've epoxied hall sensors into this stator. That's right, I screwed up two other times that you didn't see. But at least now I can show you how I installed them correctly. The hall sensors are slightly too wide to fit into the stator slots as is, so I had to grind the stator slots open a wee bit with the carbide grindy bit. Then I gouged out the excess epoxy in the slot with a pick. Then I could solder some super thin extension wires onto the hall sensors. I pulled these thin wires out of an ethernet cable. To insulate the connections, I used liquid electrical tape, as regular tape or heat shrink would have been too thick for the stator slot. Using a bright shade of green is optional, but recommended. After the very green liquid had dried, I could permanently anchor the hall sensors in the stator slots using epoxy. Because of the claw shape of the rotor, the hall sensors do have to be in the middle of the stator. This is a tip I picked up from an Osti Wawa video that I'll link to. After the epoxy hardened, I could then grind away the excess epoxy with my spinny sander and reassemble the alternator. Now hopefully these hall sensors will work in their new location of every other slot. One last test before I throw this thing in the golf cart. Let's energize the rotor and see if the hall effect sensors blink in series like they're supposed to. Brilliant! All right. Now to do the 36 wiring combinations again. After trying all 36 wiring combinations again, Still, nothing worked. What's extra strange is the first time I tried the 36 combinations of wires when the sensors were in the wrong place, the motor controller did nothing. Nothing at all, not even a twitch. But it seemed like it was accepting input from the hall sensors because as soon as I unplugged them, well then it spun up the alternator like normal. This time, however, it's acting like the hall sensors aren't even there. It's spinning up the alternator every time, like there's no hall sensors there. What? No matter how I have the hall sensors wired up, or whether or not they're plugged in at all, it spins up the alternator the same way every time. I don't get it! Now, I know that this speed controller does have some sort of programming function on it, and I did play around with it. Maybe I accidentally set up the motor controller specifically for sensorless motors without realizing it, and it's ignoring any and all input from the hall sensors. Again, I don't know! So what I'm going to do about this is Give up. No, really, I'm stopping on this project for now. I'm gonna come back to it in about a month or so, but I'm quitting on it for now because this thing's lack of ability to get itself going isn't its only problem. Those batteries aren't gonna work either. Now, I figured out ahead of time that these Ryobi batteries would be suboptimal for this use just based on math, because this is a 1500 watt motor controller and these two batteries together add up to just under 300 watt hours. So at full chooch, this thing would only run for a little over 10 minutes before it died which for a six-year-old that wants to ride all day every day is not anywhere near enough. But it's worse than I thought because I've been taking this thing for test drives, really annoying test drives where I have to get out and push start at first, but I've been taking it on test drives and another problem has popped up. For whatever reason, this motor controller with these batteries cuts out almost immediately. After like 15 seconds with these batteries fully charged, the motor controller will cut out. Now, if I flip the ignition switch off and back on again, it immediately comes back, but then it cuts out again another 15 seconds later. I don't know why it's doing that. I don't know if it's because of the BMS modules in the battery or if it's something to do with the speed controller itself. Maybe it's overcurrenting something. I don't know, and frankly, I don't care. Because, like I said, these batteries were going to be suboptimal to begin with. I'm going to come back to this project in about a month maybe two, with a whole new list of parts. First thing I'm gonna do, I'm gonna swap out these Ryobi batteries with a battery pack that I'm going to make myself. I'm gonna purchase a lot of cylindrical LifePo 4 cells and assemble a 72 volt battery pack. Because I'm using lithium cells, I'll have to buy a BMS to go with it, and because I'm using a much higher voltage rating, I'll have to buy a charger to go with it. I've actually already purchased the charger. I have purchased it ahead of time because it has to come all the way from Shenzhen, China, so that should be here in about a week or two. Then, I'm going to upgrade my motor controller. This 1500 watt motor controller is actually plenty powerful enough for my six-year-old. Assuming it could get the alternator started on its own and it didn't cut out constantly, it would be plenty of power for my six-year-old. But it's not plenty of power for my heavy butt, and maybe I want to ride this go-kart on occasion too. So I'm going to upgrade to a 3000 watt motor controller. And if I still have the same problem with the alternator, that's not a huge deal. I'm hoping the extra current from the 3000 watt motor controller will be enough to get this alternator started. But if it's not, these 3000 watt motor controllers from China typically come with their own motor. So I'll have a 3000 watt motor 
to go with it as backup. I don't want to use that thing because there's still an element of fun involved with using a converted alternator, but if I have to, it'll be there for me. So you have that project to look forward to in about a month. And the only reason I'm waiting about a month is because of the, car the cost of the parts. The cost of all these parts, even though this conversion didn't really work, was only about $100. The cost of all the parts I just mentioned for the upgrade of this project is going to be about $600, bucks, which is a fair bit of change, so I'm going to wait a bit. Obviously, this project took me quite a bit longer than I initially anticipated because of all of the setbacks. I actually started on this go-kart conversion just a week before child's birthday. Now it's over a month later, so this isn't going to be a birthday present for him. Don't worry, I got him some other backup birthday presents. But I have since shown him this go-kart in its current state and given him some really annoying test drives. By really annoying, I mean the throttle the handle isn't hooked up to the foot pedal yet, so I had to run alongside him with the throttle in my hand, and I had to push start him to get him going every time, and the battery kept cutting out, so I had to keep telling him to flip the ignition switch off and back on again. But despite all of that, he's still really excited about this go-kart, and he kept telling me, even in its current state, how fast he thinks it is. So that's great. He's really excited about it. The downside of that is that now I have an impatient and nagging six-year-old. Oh well, at least he's excited about it. So when I actually get this thing done, I know he's going to drive the pants off of it. Oh wait, it doesn't actually have pants. Anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting me, for those of you who do support me. And I'll see you next time. Thank you for following along with me on this massive journey of a project. <laughs> I expect this to be three or four days and be done with it. Didn't turn out that way.